Hi, I'm Othias, and this is not your regularly scheduled episode. My deepest apologies, but we just couldn't make it happen. If you're ever curious about the minutia of why, well, we talk about all the trials and tribulations on our patron-only behind-the-scenes podcast, which is actually what you're about to listen to now, because this audio-only interview was recorded with our buddy Danny Michael of the Cody Firearms Museum, who thankfully walked us through a complicated and controversial story of Colt revolvers and financial fraud. All right, now on to the actual interview. All right, guys, uh, I've got another podcast for you. This time I do have a guest, so no May. Um, some of you will be disappointed, I'm sorry, but this was a topic I really wanted to discuss. And my buddy Danny Michael from Cody Firearms Museum was available. What's your official title over there now? Uh, currently it is associate curator. And for the record, I'm sure May is cooler than me. No, that's, well, I don't know. I hang out with her a lot. But Danny's pretty cool, and he's come to share some secret uh, uh, horror knowledge with us because uh, I faced a lot of problems trying to write the Colt Patterson episode. Now, <laughs> before we go into what Danny and I are about to talk about, I do want to say one thing to everybody listening. Yes, I used Pirate X. <laughs> like, it, <laughs> the whole point was for repercussion to be an accessible show for well not accessible the show itself is very dense but like the actual handling of the black powder was supposed to be a way for people to go oh i can do that so we started with felt wads we started with no real fancy tools we started with um pyrodex and i thought about it too because we had time to go get more appropriate things i could go get a, like a five spout for loading the patterson and all this other stuff but i realized at that point Yes, that's nice for demonstrating the Patterson, but it's starting to get kind of heavy for demonstrating black powder to people. And I don't want to immediately scare them into not thinking that they can shoot black powder. So as we do the series, guys, you're going to see on these Pattersons, it's Pyrodex and Wad. And then when we go to the next gun, you're going to see maybe a mention of different powders or different strategies in shooting black powder because the last thing I want to do is tell somebody that they have to have triple seven. They have to have Remington uh, percussion caps. They have to have you know, this homemade uh, beef tallow, whatever wax. I, I don't want to, I don't want to overload someone. It's going to go progressively on the shooting. So hold your horses. Now, the other half of why this show was so dang difficult is I thought to myself, oh, good, I'll talk about Colt. Everybody talks about Colt. There'll be a million books to choose from. I'll find the ones that are really good. And then I'll be able to tell the story easy peasy all in English because normally I have to do a lot of translation. Then, much to my horror, I found out that there are a lot of books, and almost all of them are either written by or informed through one person who faced fraud charges in, what was it, the 1980s, Danny? 1990s? It depends on which case you're talking about. Okay. So, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, everything has to be taken with a massive grain of salt, and I ended up having to go back to the 40s for information, at which point I was faced with a lot of really unsourced material. And I'm this is this is the least comfortable I have ever been about a show that we've made, because it turns out there's really not that much detail that is known, like I would say hard known about the Colt revolver history, simply because of all the fingers that have been in the pie. So um, I asked Danny if he'd be willing to talk to you guys about why that is, like what really happened with this whole thing with uh, R.L. Wilson, because a lot of people have been asking me like, well, wait, what, what happened? Like I try to look it up, I try to Google it and it's all over the place. So Danny, what's, who was R.L. Wilson at the peak of his career? Like how did people think of him then? R.L. Wilson at the, peak of his career like when he was at the top um but he he was the guy for antique firearms in general and especially colts um you know when you and i i, I assume that we're on relatively the same level of collecting and i assume a lot of our the listeners for this are as well but there are there's sort of circles of collecting right and there's your sort of everyday collector there's a little bit more serious he was at like the tip top of collecting scope. We're talking like private broker deals between extremely wealthy people. Um, people whose collections are worth, you know, millions of dollars. And he was a guy you went to and museums consulted with him. Uh, these very wealthy collectors consulted with him. He was known to be pretty accessible despite this, you know, people 
recollect meeting him at gun shows and he would autograph a book or talk to him, even if they weren't a really high end collector, but he traveled in those circles. Uh, he, you know, he knew and was friends with the who's who of the antique gun world from the 1960s, really through the early 2000s and up until his death uh, in 2016. So this guy, like he was the guy and he wrote, I think over 50 books. Um, not all of them on, on Colts, but mostly on Colts. And then, so we're talking about like Rockstar. Yeah, absolutely. Rockstar traveled the country, traveled internationally. If you wanted a Colt opinion, it went through R.O. Wilson. Now, would it be fair to say for that time period, he would have been as recognizable? He probably would have been that period's Ian McCollum in terms of just recognizability. Uh, Yeah. I mean, that's probably as good of an, an analogy as any um as yeah, if this maybe guy... maybe maybe if ian mccollum specialized in like one little field i guess but then was still very widely recognized maybe is the way to think of it but yeah yeah he would have been he would have been super recognizable people would have known him he traveled the the gun show circuit uh yeah he was he was definitely out there and and well known okay cool and then he made money at this right yeah a, a lot of money he made um nobody's quite sure um you know it's it's hard to get of course this is several decades so you know even somebody that was well documented is is could potentially make tons of money over that kind of time frame anyways but you know we're talking like he collected you know race cars and all sorts of very early colts and high-end hunting guns and traveled on safaris you know that kind of level of wealth is the realm you should be thinking of. Okay. So we're talking about, I mean, collecting race cars says a lot, like that would be a really good indicator of, and I get it. They weren't as expensive necessarily back then, but uh, he was living high. Right. And I don't know that he had like a ton of race cars, but it it always comes up in like the articles about him, like his interest in F1 and uh, I forget which Ferrari it was, but like people that came to his house got to ride in a Ferrari. You got to shoot a machine gun, like that kind of stuff. Right. That makes sense to me. So doing well um, yes. and at a career that was not just appraising, but um, as far as I understand it, he brokered the deals. Does that mean they took a commission or was he often the direct handler? Because I saw it both ways whenever I was doing the light reading I was doing. Yeah. So he was probably best described as a broker for firearms, for firearms collectors. Um, okay. He was he was an appraiser, so he would do appraisals for collections. He was also a researcher, so he would travel to see a lot of these collections. So he knew, you know, he knew everybody that had the stuff and um, museums and private individuals as well. And he was the broker. And this is where we start to get towards what went wrong is that he was often broker on both ends. So for one transaction, he would be brokering the sale and he would be the buyer. He would be the sellers and the buyer's agent. Okay. Okay. And oftentimes the appraiser. And that was not necessarily hidden though, right? Like people knew that he was not, sometimes it was a little better known or a little more clear. It wasn't always known. And it sort of depends on the situation. What exactly went down. So there was a time in which most people would have recognized him as being a reliable, trustworthy source and probably the only really guaranteed way to get an authentic cult. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. There was a time where that, that was absolutely the case that if you wanted to guarantee you got a good cult, you went to Wilson. Okay. So that makes sense to me. So I guess, when does this start to crack? Like what I I imagine like anybody else, there's probably been detractors the whole way through. I'm sure if we were really dig into it, there's probably a couple collectors that maybe voiced early concerns, but when did people start realizing something's going on? The first, so Wilson, he got his start in firearms probably in the fifties. Um, you know, he, he was born in 1939. He worked for Colt as a PR person for a while. He spent some time, he got a history degree. I think he spent some time interning at some, you know, arms and armor collections and he pretty quickly after his time at Colt became sort of this firearms consultant. He spent a lot of time at the Colt collection in the Connecticut state library. 
but that's like late 50s early 60s by the 1970s he's pretty well established as like this up and coming appraiser it all starts to go or at least publicly it all starts to go wrong or become knowledge that something's an issue in the mid 80s when an investigation is launched into a trade that Wilson brokered for the Connecticut State Library. Okay. Now, this is a big one because this kind of comes up twice, doesn't it? Right. There's, well, there's, I say there's a, the trade is what did it, but there's actually a series of trades that happen. So it's not just one trade. And it comes up, it comes up and then it repeatedly is always cited in the later cases. So it's like, there's an investigation and the investigation closes out, but then that evidence gets regurgitated a few times later on when there's issues. At right. So what was, that, what was the, what was the nature of the original trade, I guess is where we should start. Like what was he doing for the Connecticut museum? So he had sort of ingrained himself into the museum as like, as a researcher, I think he did sort of an internship there early, really early on. We're talking like sometime in the early sixties. Right. Um, he just sort of spent a lot of time showing up there. You know, he was interested in Colts ostensibly as a researcher. So he spent a lot of time at the place with the best Colts. In 1957, Colt had given the Connecticut State Library their reference collection, which included like, which included the guns you were talking about in your episode, which, you know, is Pearson's, early Patterson's, everything they made that would be from that percussion era that we would all consider super, super historic. Right. So he, he goes there to work and he becomes very familiar with the staff. He's there a lot. He's writing books, publishing, researching, all this stuff. Um, and then the first trade I think happens in 77 where at that, by that point he's become not only a researcher to them, but he's also acting as sort of an appraiser and broker. And he starts to talk the museum staff into a series of deals that culminates in a 1979, 1980, what investigators would come to call the million dollar trade. And that trade is what then gets investigated five years later. And in it, Wilson brokers a deal between himself, another collector and the museum where 290 firearms are traded out of the museum in exchange for uh, eight guns and a cane. Oh, what was the cane? Uh, the cane is purported to have belonged to Samuel Colt. I think there's some gold, um, like gold uh, plating on it, on like the head or something like that. I, I've never actually seen a photo of the thing, but uh, the cane was supposed to be a personal belonging of, of Sam Colt. Mm. Is the cane in dispute too now? Uh, I don't think it's in, in dispute. I think it's pretty well regarded that it is a Sam Colt item. Okay. It's just the value was... Every one right. of these items' values is in dispute. Right, I got you. So, two hundred. Now, I heard on the two ninety, a lot of it was um, surplus. In other words, the museum already had an example. That's what Wilson said. So, this is where we start to get into an uh, okay. story. Wilson, Wilson became the firearms expert really for the museum because the state library staff weren't necessarily firearms experts, so they came to rely on Wilson. There had been an appraisal in the, of the collection in 1974 by Norm Flaterman. And Flaterman was actually sanctioned by the state legislature to be like the consultant for the firearms collection. And one of the issues that investigators noted that Flaterman wasn't really consulted later through this trade process. But mm -hmm. Wilson was the one that was in and out of the collection as a researcher and there every day and built that, you know, daily sort of Trust. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure they had a good relationship with Flaterman too, but you know, you go to the guy you see the most, which makes right. sense to me. Um, David White was, I believe, the library director at the time, a guy named David White. He, there was also some curatorial staff that were involved in this. White, during the trades, sort of claimed he had the knowledge and authority to carry out the trades. Later with investigators, he would claim that he didn't know that much about guns and that these got approval. Then the investigators would ask him, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but then investigators right. would have him like, did you really take this to the board? Can you prove that? And he'd be like, well, no, we didn't take it to the board. 
Um, and he, he would try and portray himself as a sort of naive, unknowing, trusted Wilson. Wilson took advantage of it. That's how White portrayed it. Okay. So, now, was he, was he yeah. always supposed to be the check against Wilson? Was he supposed to be the second man that was sort of double checking or was he just there? He was just sort of there. He was the guy that had the access to the collection, and that's who Wilson, you know, worked with to study the collection, to get access to the collection, to to research it. The right. check was supposed to be that any trade was supposed to be approved by the library's board, uh, which the board, and there's some stipulations. When Colt gave the collection to the state library, um, there were stipulations. Colt said none of the guns can ever be sold, so that was one issue. Uh, uh, and then one of the issues is that Colt said none of the guns could be traded unless they are, ex and Colt used the language, exact duplicates, which is another part of the contention. So how'd they get around that when they did the deal? So really, they never, none of this stuff got submitted to the board is what came out in the investigation. And Wilson used a broad definition of exact duplicates, a very broad oh boy. Um, you know, he said, well, it's a variation, but it's of the type. So, and this is Will Wilson's own words here. Like I'm not putting words in his mouth. He said to investigators, he like, it, he considered it a duplicate if there were other sort of referenceable pieces from that time period in Colt's history. Um, it, you know, I, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to, you know, I've read this investigation pretty thoroughly and I, I think that's a pretty accurate portrayal of how he saw duplicates. <laughs> So even on the even on the face of it, let's say that his appraisals were correct. Let's say, you know, everything's above board except for the part where they're now in violation of Colts. Uh, what would you even call that? Is that a stipulation? That would be like, like the what? we'd call it a deed of gift today. Okay, deed of gift in, mu in museum terminology, we'd call that their deed of gift. That they'd be in violation of that gift agreement. And how does that ever get punished anyway? Like, what do you really do with that? Like 50 years later, nothing. I mean, I don't know of a lot of cases where that has been pursued. Um, museums anymore are really hesitant to take very restrictive gifts. You know, I, very many museums today probably would not take a that gift like that. Or they would deal. negotiate yeah. something better with Colt um, to be a little more flexible. But... You know, I assume that if both sides had it in writing, this was the agreement, uh, they could go back to that and say, well, the agreement was violated. Um, yeah. I don't know if you could press like civil charges. Obviously, there's not it's not a criminal. Yeah, I don't know what the restitution is on that. That's very interesting. It is, is it is curious to see that Colt sort of saw it coming, too. That's kind of funny that 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 exact thing was there. And then. Yeah. It, anyway. And there's a, there's quite a bit of backstory. So the trade is actually the culmination of a series of deals where I see the problems start with Wilson's career. So the trade is what makes it public in 85. And there's a lot of problems with the trade, but the trade happens because of another Wilson deal that uh -oh. happens before it. And this one is net. This one was never an issue that was officially everything in this, for the issue I'm about to talk about happened legally you know, it, it's sort of questionable ethics, but it all happens matter of okay, fact, so, legally, whatever. So we have, what, is, what was it called? The million dollar deal? Or what, what was the name for yeah, the big one? The million dollar trade is what the investigators called it. Okay, so the million dollar trade is the big one. But before that, you have this sort of uh, event or trade that, what are we going to call this? The, so the this precursor? One, I, yeah, it's a precursor. I, the only thing I, I can call it by the collector's name. So there's a guy named Soli, S-O-L-L-E-Y, okay. who is, he's some, I think he inherits like an oil fortune or something like that, but he's, he's from money. And in the mid seventies, he decides he wants a gun collection. And okay. Wilson is the guy to go to if you want that at the time. And so Soli hires him to be his broker. Go find me good guns. Wilson approaches other dealers in the antique trade, you know, the high level dealers starts buying up Colts and other antique firearms for Soli. Wilson will only ever tell anybody he has a Mr. X as his buyer. He never gives an identity. Will Wilson's like guarding this guy. And this is where I'll start to editorialize a little bit. I think Wilson's guarding him as sort of a little bit of a cash cow. Like Wilson does other dealers would love to be able to sell this guy guns. 
Wilson wants to make sure that he's the one brokering it's, it. And yeah, right. He, of course, he, you know, he says it's because he wanted to keep solely wanted to stay anonymous. And maybe there's something to that, you know, but what ends up happening is Wilson makes a commission ac according to the agreement. Wilson buys the guns and as other dealers remember it, Wilson always wrote from his own checkbook. So Wilson pays his money to the guns, then charges solely an amount. Wilson, so Wilson's really buyer than immediately seller. He's also the appraiser right. for these transactions. Solely dies in 78 or 79. Um, okay. So he only collects for a few years, but in those three to four years, he buys, he spends six to seven million dollars on firearms. And that's 1970s dollars. You know, that's a lot of money. No, that that's a lot of firearms. You could get firearms cheaper than too. Yeah, you get firearms cheaper. You know, we're not adjusting for inflation here. And, you know, you could make some argument that collecting wasn't was still on the upswing in terms of popularity. So there's probably some better deals to be had. Um, there's all sorts of ways to frame it, but it's a lot of money. Even, you know, seven million dollars today. If you said that's my budget to start a firearms collection, you could do some serious damage. Oh yeah. So that's what Sully spends. Wilson then, Wilson, the, where it starts to get weird is Sully never actually takes possession of any of the guns. The guns stay at Wilson's house. So Sully's uh -oh. buying these guns. Wilson is storing them because Wilson and Sully, I think Wilson convinces Sully that, um, and I might be saying Sully, it might be Sully or I don't know, but right. Wilson convinces him that his house isn't secure enough so they stay at Wilson. Sully will come over and check one out every once in a while, but continuing to buy and sell. And amasses what's, by all accounts, a great American firearms collection. Um, then Sully dies, and his estate takes control of the collection. And so his estate and the bank have to... They have to figure out what to do, and it's offered to Wilson because he's been caretaking the collection so far. Oh, uh, okay. So the bank offers it to him. Wilson has his appraisal that he provides to the bank of $4 million, which is clearly $2 million under what Sully had paid already, plus whatever commission paid to Wilson. Wow, okay. On top of that. So that's a big discrepancy. The bank hires a guy named Alan Kelly to be the secondary appraiser. Kelly vouches for Willis Wilson's appraisal. What I believe is unknown to the bank is that Wilson and Kelly have both signed on to a private limited partnership to buy Soli's collection together. And the four guys in this, there's Soli, or excuse me, there's Wilson, um, Kelly, a guy named Chernoff, and another one I'm blanking on right now. And allegedly, actually not that allegedly, but because it comes up later that Wilson also has a silent partner in Nixon's Secretary of the Treasury, United States Secretary of the Treasury. Um, okay. So they want to buy the Soli collection because they know how good it is. And they're all worried that if the bank sends it to Christie's, because Christie's has already expressed interest in auctioning it, if the bank sends it to Christie's, it'll go to public auction and it will depress the values in their trade, in the anti-firearms trade. They, they say, if this many guns go at once to auction, they'll all be on public record. Like, and they are clear about this. This is not, I'm, again, I stress that I'm not putting words in their mouth here. Like, this is definitely comes up in the investigation. That they are worried that if these guns go to auction, it sets a precedent. And I think in one of them says, the antique gun business would be hurt for a long, long time. So, Just because of so many being released to market at once. So many being released, and I think the unsaid thing here is they are not getting to control the price. Right. So if these guns stay in private transactions, they all get to say this is worth... They're all appraisers. They're all dealers. They all get to say this is what this is worth. This is what you should pay, and that sort of thing. And they all state later in the... Well, not all of them, but some of them later in the investigation state that they agreed this partnership agreed. They sort of sat down and looked at the list of Soli's collection and said, I want this one. Okay. I want this one. Okay. I don't want this one. You guys want this one. No, we're good. And they all say which ones they want, which ones they want for resale and which ones they're not interested in. 
and they agree together to appraise the ones they want low so they can buy them cheap from the bank, appraise the ones they've wanted to sell high so that they can then turn around and resell them high. Right. And so they come up with 1.7 million worth of guns that they want to buy from the bank. So that leaves a big chunk of the collection left over to buy. Wilson tells them he's having trouble finding a buyer. And the reason I think the bank didn't know about this deal is because they all pay Wilson to pay the bank. So it's not like the bank has four people that are all bringing them a check for their share of the purchase. They're all, so the, Wilson appears to- The bank the essentially bank. believes that they are working with, okay, so the bank essentially believes they're transacting with Wilson. Correct. And that they're, the bank's agent is, I forget his name already. So that the Kelly guy is an independent right, appraiser to verify it, but he's on the but, partnership. But they're, but they're, but they're telling, but the bank's relying on Kelly to uh, verify. Yeah, he was their backup. Is Wilson is Wilson's appraisal right. okay? So the, the bank's the bank's man is in a business deal with Wilson for the collection that he's supposed to be double appraising for the bank. Right, and he was. I mean, okay, he's yes. he's like a hired he, third party appraiser, but yes, yeah. Is the bank paying him to do the appraisal? I would imagine, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yep, I, I'm on this. I'm, I'm feeling it now. Okay. So then, let's. Be, I got to figure out where I'm at. Okay, so Wilson tells, he has the money from these guys to buy for about half the collection's value. He's got to find out what to do with the other half. He's got to come up with the other half of the money to buy it for that $4 million. Right. So he approaches a guy named Hutchison. Hutchison used to be a business partner with one of the guys in the partnership but they fell out. Wilson tells the guys in the partnership that he's having trouble coming up with another buyer, but he thinks he's got somebody. What's clear from Hutchison's later investigation is that Hutchison was like trying to get in on this and Wilson was sort of keeping him at bay, like playing hard to get. Finally, Hutchison becomes a partner to this deal, but he's always kept separate. Like Wilson keeps these two parts. He only calls Hutchison Mr. X, sort of like he did with Sully, and won't reveal the identity of this other buyer. And he tells, even though these guys have decided amongst themselves, there's a half of the collection we don't want. It's not that good. Wilson tells Hutchison, here's $1.4 million worth of guns. They're really awesome. You have to buy it all or you can't buy any of it. Oh, boy. Hutchison goes to his dad for the money and gets it plus interest. Man, I need that kind of dad. Right. Then, so then Wilson has the money to go to the bank, but here's what they do. Solely bought the guns for between six and 7 million. Wilson and Kelly appraised the guns at 4 million. The group then offer the group through Wilson, who the bank's dealing with Wilson offers the bank 3.2 million just to get rid of the collection all at once. And the bank agrees to it. Oh, okay. So they've paid like half the money that this was originally cost somebody to get. And this is, you know, we're talking. Well, the money that was paid, because we don't even necessarily at this point now, I'm sitting here going, how many, how many pieces did he actually buy? And how much of that six, seven million went into pocket? You know what I mean? Right. There's that question about it. And of course, this does not even get into the question of like the, the commission fees that Wilson probably was charging Sully. Um, so then these guys start taking these guns and they start selling them, dealing them, collecting them, whatever. Hutchison, not real, you know, he's been convinced that he's got a really good group of the collection. This is by 79, late 78, 79, when this is all settled out. Right. He immediately has trouble selling these guns for why the other dealers recognize these weren't great guns. And he's having trouble selling them. He's like, he's... His dad is like, I want my money back. That's a lot of money, you know, because he paid 1.4 million. Right. And there was interest on this. And so Hutchison has trouble. And so what I think, this is me, again, going into editorial mode here. I think Wilson had already concocted this plan a while ago uh, and a while before this. So Wilson talks Hutchison into approaching the state library for a trade. These guys all understood in their later testimony that all understood that the library had the best Colts out there and that the, the library had these guns and they all wanted access to them. They all wanted them. They wanted them out of the collection. They wanted them in the collecting world, not in the museum. And that gets into this whole collection of like, or whole question of museums first collecting that we talk about, you know, semi-regularly it's, you know, 
it's an important question. Don't get me wrong. But these guys were on a really dark side of that question, in my opinion. And I say mm -hmm. that as a museum person, so take it for what it's worth. But right. these guys wanted those guns out of the collection. Wilson, who had worked for the collection, chief among them. So Hutchison and Wilson approach the library where Wilson is very trusted and say, we have these really great guns. We think, you know, you guys have a lot of duplicates. Let's do a trade here. And the library and Wilson prior to this has already started doing trades for the library. So in 77, before all this went down, he's already done at least one trade where he got guns for a former cult executive. He told the library the guns were going to a future cult museum. He gets them out. Some go to the executive. The rest, Wilson just sells. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was never going to a museum. The no, this is time, this is this is all factual stuff. This isn't up for debate. Yes. This is all things that happen. This is not. This is not. We're not even in the speculative area. We're not speculating that much. It, it's known that Wilson, he said, like he admitted to investigators that he at various time had plans for these to go to a museum. Other people wrote, Wilson told me these were going to a museum. The guns never went to a museum. The guns were sold. Like, this is just, I'm trying to be, like, I feel very strongly about this, so I'm sure my bias is coming through, but I'm trying to be as, like, straightforward and factual about it as I can. Right. So in 77, when this trade happened, one of the museum people, not David White, but another person there said, wrote to White and said, this seems fine to us, but shouldn't we have someone outside check or get an outside opinion? Something like that. They, they're they like, Wilson is buyer and seller here. Can we get this double checked? Right. His, his comment went totally ignored, like absolutely ignored. And that's sort of the first inkling that something's going wrong is in 77 when that initial trade happens. So then go back to 78, 79. Hutchison and Wilson or. Wilson approaches the museum to introduce them to Hutchison. Right. It's unclear how much of the plan Wilson shared with Hutchison. But Wilson says, hey, Dave, at the museum, I have a great thing. I have this guy that's got really great Colts. He's interested in trading out some of your duplicates. You know, he's he, of course, has reasons why they're going to sell them that don't pan out the way he says they will. They finally, you know, Hutchison recalls that he was approached very skeptically by museum staff, but eventually is led into the collection. Um, White trusts Wilson to evaluate the guns to go out on trade and the guns coming in. So Wilson appraises the guns coming in at $1.1 million, eight guns at 1.1 million, including what is now known as the Van Sickle or Van Cycle Dragoons. I've actually never, I've read it a bunch, but I've never heard it pronounced. Okay. Uh, so and, wait, let me let me before you go any further, yeah. I want to make sure I'm following this right. So, as castoffs from a previous deal, Hutchison ends up with what is supposed to be 1.4 million dollars in guns. Correct. Eight of those, the eight guns that are then offered to the library are appraised at 1.1 million or something like that. Right. Wilson does that appraisal. Right. Yes. But it's eight guns out of however many of the lot. So it's not even the whole right. lot. It's not the whole 1.4 lot. Correct. It's some sub number of that. Correct. So all, whatever number of guns Hutchison got, do we know that number? Was it a lot of guns? I've never seen the whole list of what Hutchison got. I've never seen the whole list of the Sully collection. Um, okay. I don't know that it exists. It might so it could have been 10 guns. We don't really know. Right. It could have been 10. It could have been 100. We're not. We're not really okay, sure. I'm just I'm making sure because sure. those numbers are so close together, and yet it's such a handful of guns that you know. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so he has eight guns for 1.1 million. I'm back on the same page now. Yep. Then Wilson does the appraisal for the gun, the 290 guns leaving the museum, at also close to 1.1 million. He keeps it within about fifty thousand dollars of each other when he writes. Okay. Everything. The guns coming in include what is purported to be a serial number one Patterson or just okay. serial number one Patterson and these, the set of Dragoon pistols. And it comes out later to, I should probably save this for later, but I'll just say it now. Cause we're here. Two of the guns coming in later turn out to be 
stolen guns that had been stolen from Colt before they gave them to before they gave their collection to the um, to the state library. So back in the early '50s, a number of guns are replaced, stolen, and replaced with imitations in the Colt collection by a guy that's doing PR work for him. Nobody's quite sure how many. Wilson says Wilson later says it's up to a dozen, and he actually points to a book he wrote in the '60s, opens it up in front of invest. This is Wilson's own like testimony to investigators. Says. I wrote this book from the Sutherland collection and this one's stolen, this one's stolen, this one's stolen, this one's stolen. I think Wilson knew they were stolen when he wrote the book. He's pretending to know they were stolen then. What's clear to investigators later is that Wilson and Hutchison knew these guns had been stolen from Colt and had they not been stolen from Colt, they would have been given to the state library. So the part of this trade are guns the state library should have had in the first place. And the two and those two guns are valued at about ninety thousand dollars worth of this trade. And they're stolen property, so they should stolen have been property. turned over. Period. Right. The prevailing attitude among the group, Wilson and Hutchison, all seem to be, well, these guns were stolen. People took guns from Colt. People took guns from Winchester. These guns won't shouldn't really be locked away in a museum, anyways. And Wilson regularly used the word in terms of this deal of liberated. So, like, that should give you some idea of his idea of where these guns belonged. Right. So, he, so they do, they get the library to agree now, to the trade. Now, before we uh, go any further, I want to say there is some argument that if the guns were stolen, the only way to get them back might have been to flush them out with cash. That happens. Yeah, that is, that's an argument. Like, that is, it wouldn't have been the first time in the gun collecting world where stolen guns had to get flushed out with cash. I'll just okay. put it that way. Like, that's, I mean, it's. I just yeah. want to make sure I'm representing, yeah. you know, the. And, however, it does. It does not look like that's. Uh, it, these guns look like they were well in hand off of a buyer that could have eaten the loss or not, and blah. there was time for this to get resolved without having. It looks like they were in hand without having to flush them out with cash. Right, and, you know, I'm here. I'm editorializing a little bit again. I think based on what I've read in the Connecticut State Police report. Or investigation that they knew i'm supposing they knew there's clearly some problems with stolen guns coming back the question is when wilson and hutchison knew about them being stolen i think wilson thought he was exonerating himself but the way he states it i think he knew maybe as early as the 1960s that these guns belonged back at the colt collection okay so that's that's me surmising that one gets less factual and somewhat surmising but the guns were guns that were stolen came back into the collection during this trade that's four part that's factual right in, in an exchange of 1.1 million dollars right so the guns come in and they're traded and they go out wilson says you know they're they're supposedly duplicates that aren't that great they're appraised at roughly 1.1 million what comes out in the investigation is that these guns are immediately being sold. Like investigators suspect that Wilson had buyers lined up before the trade was finalized. Right. And they're being sold for double their appraised value almost immediately. So, so before we go too deep, hold on, I want to make sure I do this. Um, you have ostensibly, if we're looking at this in the most charitable light, the idea is that there's eight super cool guns that right. are $1.1 million. There's 290 guns that are roughly the same value because they're not super cool. They're yeah, already out there in the market. Um, and the idea being is for Hutchison, the reason you would want to do this is that it can be very hard to liquidate eight guns that value at $1.1 million, but it can be fairly easy to liquidate 290 guns because you can find a lot of smaller buyers for them. And then that right. makes you more liquid. It opens up the, the theory being that it opens up a bigger buyer's pool. And Wilson always maintained that he was working in the best interest of the museum, that he truly believed they were getting better guns than they were losing. And he also always maintained that he didn't make any money off of this deal, which, you know, I'll just say I sort of because even if he didn't make any money, it may have been to get the pressure off from the previous one point four million dollar deal. Right. Okay. I, I don't believe that he didn't make any money, but he always maintained that he didn't. He also no. maintained, it, it, weirdly, 
not corroborating that, he also maintained that when he sold some of these guns, he just got lucky. You know, the appraisal was what, you know, the appraisal got him. He found a, the right buyer at the right time and got lucky. Which, that can happen. That can happen. But but you're talking about, so you would expect to see the guns sell for 10, 15% over on average of the appraisal if, if Hutchison's supposed to make his money back, I guess is what we're saying. Like right. Hutchison wants this to be equal to one point four million dollars. So in theory, these two hundred ninety guns should hopefully make him one point four, and then that's sort of on the level with this one point one million trade. Right. I guess is the the loosest way I can think about it. Now yeah. Hutchison doesn't sell them though. Wilson sells them. Yeah, that part is unclear to me. Who was getting what out of the trade? Because Wilson is definitely selling some of these. Hutchison might be selling some of them through Wilson. That might be the okay. other thing that's going on because again, Wilson often was broker, buyer, seller, and appraiser. So like he's still and, touching them again. He's still touching them again, even after the trade with the state library is complete. And regularly receiving double double the estimated value. Right. Okay. This okay, I'm on the same page. So that goes surprisingly under the radar the only person that like the, none of this then comes out to there's some rumors in the collecting world that something's going on with the state library what happens that there what starts an investigation is a collector that likes to go to the library notes that a bunch of the guns have been replaced over the course of the last few years and he sends a letter to the state police and he think he thinks the guns have been stolen I, th I is what i think he first thinks because they're just missing right he's like these guns have been there's lesser quality guns in these cases what's going on here i think they're being right. stolen so the state police started seemingly as like guns are being stolen we need to find out because they they make all these notes about the the lax security at the at the displays right um so, so they think to... they think it's possibly a substitution problem yes um and i think they think that there might be employees sort of substituting these guns. Which would be a lot like the original Winchester theft, actually. Or which well, other, the, original Colt, the original Colt theft, rather. Right. That would be a okay. lot like that theft. Okay. So that's what they think might be going on. And so they start investigating all these parties. And they interview, they end up interviewing at least half of the silent sort of partnership. They interview Wilson. They interview Hutchison. Uh... They interview the assistant curator, the curator. They interview David White. And they, what happens is Alan Kelly offers a lot of details on how this whole setup worked. Because Wilson, of course, you know, he sort of, he's smart enough to keep himself at bay and pretend that he's exon just trying to exonerate himself. Nothing happened. It's wrong. He works for the museum. Alan Kelly spills a lot of details, and none of these are warranted searches. So this is all voluntary, I will talk to you. Because the police call, I'm Detective So-and-so with the state police. Will you talk to us? Yes, I'll talk to you. Here's the documents I'm willing to provide. They don't actually... Right. Like, if, if it got to the point where warrants were being issued, I'm sure we could know this whole system a lot better. But that never happens. The state police interview, Kelly gets pissed at Wilson because Kelly wasn't in on the museum trade. Kelly knew about all the guns in... And this is me trying to f interpret what's going on. Based okay, on so now we're in speculation. Now we're in some more speculation. The deal happens. William's silent partners didn't know about the Hutchison trade. They just knew they were getting the Sully guns to buy and sell how they wanted, which is, I think there's some hinky stuff there in that they sort of misled the bank. Wilson had misled Sully. These guys clearly were doing whatever they could to kind of take advantage of each other. Right. But... It's nothing other, you know, that to me is sort of like this weird, slightly hostile business deal. Right. Um, and the bank probably doesn't care that much because they just wanted to settle the estate and be done with it. And they got right. money. So it's private, it's private property dispute at that point. Right. That's a private property dispute. And nobody seems to walk away particularly unhappy until the other guys learn that Wilson and Hutchison got all the guns out of the museum and they didn't get any of the action. Right. So then Kelly starts trying to come up with trades between when the investigation starts and when the trade happens. Like, so after the trade, but before the investigation starts, Kelly starts trying to come up with trades for the museum because there's still good stuff left. 
and we should probably once i'm done telling this part i'll talk about some of the stuff that left because i think that'll give listeners an idea of why the values are suspect right um so then kelly is by the since kelly got left out of that trade he's very willing to talk to investigators when the investigation opens in 85 because that collector that would have got suspicious about guns being stolen he did not report anything until 1985 so that's why it takes so long for the investigation to start because they didn't have any tips or so right. to them, nobody knew anything had happened the state library yeah um so some of the guns that came out probably the most famous gun that came out is a colt pearson prototype so a pre-production colt pearson and if you buy the argument this is where to me like it becomes really hard to swallow the argument that wilson was just Actually trading out best. duplicates because right. it's a Pearson. There, there, there's not a duplicate. You know, that's, it just isn't. Um, and, and some other guns have gotten out. That, now, hold on, on the history side of things, because yeah. some of you have watched the episode carefully and some haven't, just to remind you, Pearson is the one that Colt pays with his money from selling nitrous oxide shows. So he goes around, he does his performing show, and he, he cobbles together the cash that he can. He pays Pearson to sort of do the development work, they're fairly crude guns by comparison to an actual Patterson. Yeah, they're they're total handmade, I think all in Baltimore, from what I understand. Right. Um, and yeah, they're, they're pretty crude, but I mean, obviously a, an important part of Colt's history. And because they're handmade, they're definitely not, you know, if you go back to very strictly read the Colt gift, exact duplicates, Pearsons don't have exact duplicates because they were all individually right. made. Right. So that's where Wilson's duplicates thing starts to fall apart. Um, and of course, the gun that replaces the Pearson is a Patterson, which is a really cool Patterson. But but there's no such thing as a Patterson that can be as cool as the Pearson. Yeah, in my opinion, yeah. And because no matter, even if it's first or even if it's a transitional, arguably there's going to be, there's, a, there's an institutional method behind it. Right. And um, a bunch of the guns that go out are like single digit serial numbered guns. So, you know, when you think of a duplicate, I'm thinking, all right, we have serial number four. Let's get rid of serial number 1500. Not right. let's keep 1500 and get rid of four, which is kind of what went on. Oh boy. Um, so, you know, and those, to me, those, those low serials are going to be more critical for understanding any sort of early changes in the design as well. Absolutely. You, they, they provide, especially in the 1830s and really for all the 19th century, the changes in productions between, you know, the changes in how a gun is made from one to 10, you know, there's, there's changes there. It, it's true for just about every manufacturer in that era. Nobody starts out. There's a learning curve for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course there's, there's like pre-production guns that go out in this trade there's the low serial number of guns and there's the Pearson. So that's the kind of stuff going, is going out. Um, in the investigation, um, it also, a number of things come out in the investigation. Sort of Kelly was upset with Wilson that he didn't get in on the deal. A, so our former curator by the name of Herb House, Herb, Herb was actually just freshly in Cody in the early 80s. And he had come across, in, in his personal collecting, he had come across two Colt muskets that had left the library during the trade. They're Colt Civil War muskets. They're pre-production muskets for the Colt, Colt's Army contracts, as I recall the details. And Herb recognized these being from the Colt collection, but not necessarily from the state library, I believe, is how this went. Herb got them from a collector, and then Herb traded them back to the state library. So it's just two guns of the 290. What investigators were really surprised about when they interviewed David White is like, you said these were duplicates three years before this, and then you said they're worth bringing back into the collection here. Like, what's going on with that? So that's another issue that crops up. Another, another, another issue that crops up is that the assistant curator, she had an affair with Hutchison while the trade was being negotiated. And Wilson's <laughs> oh. ex-wife suspected that she was also having an affair with Wilson. So there's a weird love triangle involved in all this. And immediately, nearly just a couple of years after the trade, I guess I shouldn't say immediately, Wilson goes through a divorce. And Kelly notes, 
both during the trade and during the divorce, Wilson kept his checkbook in pencil. He would total up all the figures, come to a total, and then erase the figures. And that on his invoices for consulting and appraising and all that during the divorce, he would write no charge, like he was doing this sort of pro bono for free for friends or something like that, to give less paper trail for the divorce attorneys to take money from him. Okay. So, you know, that it's weird to bring it up because it's not directly related to the trade, but a guy that's keeping his checkbook in pencil is iffy. Right. Investigators asked Kelly to appraise the value of the trade, which Kelly is hard to take without a grain of salt because he's sort of complicit in that earlier deal, but he's not complicit in the trade. He's complicit in the Sully stuff, but not the trade. Right. So he's, by the way, anything that's being reported by Kelly, we have to take huge grain of salt because like you said, the first potential eh, trade, like the one that's like, but then also he's mad that he wasn't yeah. included in the, so he wants to burn it all down anyway. Right. He kind of wants to burn. So there's kind of a couple grains of salt on Kelly, but investigators ask him for his opinion of, a, of an appraisal. And he says the guns that went out are worth 3.2 million, I think is the number he comes up at. Okay. He says the guns that came in are worth like 680,000. The investigators get another person to check the appraisal. That guy comes up with a figure of like two point something million of guns going out and a, like 800,000 for guns coming in. The, the two figures aren't that close, but they both suggest, Not especially because the other appraiser isn't as suspect as Kelly. Another problem that came up during all these trades was Norm Flaterman had done the appraisal of the collection in 74 and the state legislator legislature had recognized Flaterman as the person that was supposed to, I, I think I mentioned this, but they recognized him as the person supposed to be doing this, but he was never consulted in any of this, nor during, I don't think he was consulted during the investigations either, which is a little bit weird for me, but right. there's that. But these two guys later on say, this is the value of the trade. And of course, all these guns by 85 and 86 have been sold for, you know, double their, you know, a hundred guns don't, typically increase in price 100% in just a few years and 100% or more. Yeah, they didn't have Ian McCollum videos ruining everything. But yeah, a video didn't come out and the guns weren't like instantly then popular. So there's all those factors that make this whole trade super suspect. And then we get to the guns that have come. So White, he leaves the museum after the investigation. The assistant curator that had the affair, she was gone. One of my favorite details in the whole story is during her interview, the investigators track her down because she's already left the museum at this point. I think I'm getting that right. Investigators interview her. And at the end of her interview, <laughs> this is so, I don't know why I love this detail so much, but she asked the investigators to tell Hutchison she was asking about him because she hadn't spoken to him since 1980. And she oh knew the investigators God. were going to be talking to him. And it's just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently Hutchison can lay down some love because yeah, she's apparently still remembering him. Dude's got some moves. So, yeah. hey. Um, so the investigators write a report that is published in 1986, and they conclude that the state has been defrauded. And their language, you know, you would expect state police officers to use some pretty guarded language, but the language in this report is, um, I'm going to pull it up here because it's our sad duty to report to you that the library and thus the people of Connecticut have suffered serious and irreplaceable losses. One of a kind historical treasures having no duplicates in the entire world, much less the state library, have been traded into the private sector and sold for profit. Stolen guns have been received in trade by the library. A replica or fake firearm has been housed in the library as authentic. A $50,000 donation was received by the library by one of its trading partners at a time and under such circumstance as to give the trade the appearance and perhaps the effect of a sale of a historical treasure. A 22-year-old female library employee told investigators she engaged in a personal relationship with the other party to the most disadvantage, dis, disadvantageous trade while she assisted those persons negotiating the trade with him. So, like, the investigators are pretty clear on what they feel happened. Oof. The, 
the fifty thousand dollar donation was actually a trade that happened after the million dollar deal, but was again brokered by Wilson. So there's there's five different trades that happened. Only one, and that's the Herb House trading the guns back into the collection, is ever a pr is ever taken to the board. Um, the, all the other deals are Wilson trading guns out of the collection, pretty much. And the reason this does not go to trial, and this, you know, I've already said it involves the you know the Sully deal involved the Secretary of the Treasury. Reportedly, some of these guns are sold to the King of Jordan. I think um, some are sold to Australia, some are sold in Europe, some reports of guns being sold to Japan. Oh boy. Um, but these guns are dispersed everywhere, suffice to say. Uh, and, you know, these are just all the rumors about where they went. We don't have like a dispositions list from Wilson, L at least not that I know of. The investigators take this all to the state's attorney. The state's attorney feels that the statute of limitations by 1985 for the charges they could bring against Wilson and the others has run out. So Wilson is never charged in conjunction with this, even mm, though the a lot of investigators money. say we have been, we as a state have been defrauded. And I think one of the people that's investigating at the time, like this goes to Joseph Lieberman, who would be a future now past presidential candidate or vice presidential candidate, I forget. Um, so there's like, I mean, it involves, you know, high officials. It involves a love triangle. It involves stolen guns and foreign transactions and high finances and all this stuff. One of the things that I've been talking about this for a while, but I think it's also important to note the follow-up to this is that the successors to David White, that, that museum employee, those Dragoon pistols that I talked about earlier, they claim his successors will go on to claim these are Belgian knockoffs in, that Wilson presented as Colts. They are Belgian knockoffs that somebody embellished, presented as original Colts, original embellished in the U.S. Colts. You know, period embellished, at least, if not at the Colt factory. The, they will then say these guns are not. They sell the guns to then, you know, in the museum well, staff. Sl sl slow down, because I think we're getting, Sorry. like, it's, it's almost too blended. So, um, of the eight guns that came in, a pair of Dragoons. Yes, a pair of Colt Dragoons. No, they're, they're not like, sequential or anything, are they? There's nothing... Uh, they're a cased pair, so... They okay. Might, they're a cased okay. pair. So, they're supposed to be together. It's not two separate right. guns. That It's one set of guns. Right. And then, they have, there's a name, I forget. Um, the Van Sickle or Cycle. I'm not sure how yeah, it's Van Cycle. How is it spelled? S-Y? S-Y... C K E L E, I think. No, the, the that name is supposed to be the man who purchased them and had them privately embellished straight out of Colt. Right. He now, bought the, the Yeah. Was the original claim that Colt embellished them or that they were period embellished? People now say that Wilson never claimed they were Colt embellished. At least one person at the library staff says that Wilson claimed they were Colt embellished. So if you believe in these guns, then you believe that they were purchased by Van Sickle Cycle, um, and he had them privately embellished outside in, of Colt. In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, at the same time he got them. Right. Shortly after he got them, he had them embellished by a fairly well-known engraver. All right. If you don't believe in these guns, then you believe that they were made in Belgium. You believe they were Belgian Colt copies that have been modern... 20th century engraved oh okay so it's not even that they were made in belgium and engraved then it's that they were a are not even colts and right. b were engraved now but does anybody believe that they were original colts that were engraved now nowadays no one claims that i've seen there's some other pistols owned by this guy and i've seen some auction listings that try and like make a case that oh, look, this gun's engraved a little weird too, so maybe those guns are legit. But yeah, I think nobody now holds that they were Colt engraving. Okay, so either Colt made, period, embellished, or Belgian made, modern, embellished are the big two theories right now. Right. Okay. And, and then... Oh, like, sorry. This gets into a question of like, 
fraud fraud in the gun collecting world because I think none of us like the idea that there are engravers who can copy original work out there, but they certainly existed at the time. I'm sure they exist now. Um, and I don't mean like the people that are publicly doing like rest, like really high level restoration work. I mean like guys sort of working in the corners I don't know, on the fringes who like they're intentionally doing work to defraud people. It's right. not something but, we like to acknowledge, but it was out there. And this is where I sort of sound a little bit like crazy conspiracy theory, but Wilson would have known who they were. Right. So the thought is that Wilson perhaps had uh, gotten a hold of a Belgian set. The markings or some other feature of them would have given away that they were Belgian made. So mm -hmm. he had them embellished as if they had been embellished long ago. And right. then that way it would obscure the Belgian markings. Right. That's sort of the darkest timeline. Okay. That's the, that's the fear. That's the ultimate, like, uh Oh, this could be this. Right. We so, don't know that, but that's yeah. the, that's, that's the evil ending versus good ending. Right. Right. Um, and then to my understanding, the reason that these pistols become important is because even after the million dollar deal, even after the investigation, some number of years have gone by and they end up being sold or what's going on? So yeah, in the late eighties, then the state library has the chance to purchase a, um, it, it's a statue. It's some sort of statue or like a, I believe it was an original, I, 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 what I was reading, cause you sent me some of this material. I think it was an original cult rampant cult. Like it was supposed to yeah, be like yeah, the yeah. logo. Yeah. So it was a, it was a statue from cult that was the cult logo that was very iconic. Right. So they have the chance. And this one is like, this one is without it. Everybody agrees. This is the thing it's supposed to be. And the museum wants it, but it's going to cost a lot of money. So the, then the muse, the museum staff who are no longer the staff that took part in the trade say, these guns are not of cult is the language they use. We're going to sell them at auction to help us get to the financial goal to buy the rampant cult. Okay. So um, and I read a little bit. This is where I'm on board now, weirdly, because I did manage to make it through this article. There was a, a private buyer that bought the Colt statue Correct. for, I think, like 500000 mm -hmm. He needed to get 700000 for it because he had tried selling it for a number of years. He had been shipping and insuring it and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So he won 700000 for it. He makes a deal with the library. The library tries to do a regular fundraiser. They make 20000 nowhere near even a tiny fraction of it. And so the library goes, okay, well, we can sell uh, some of the stuff we have. And so they reach for this pair of guns along with some other stuff, and they need them to go to auction. Right. And the auction company, do you remember which auction company it was? I want to say it was Bonhams. Was it Bonhams? I think. I could be wrong on that, but I think it okay. was Bonhams. So it goes to the auction company, and now there's a dispute because the auction company wants top dollar. So they're gonna they try to say we want to represent them as Colts, mm -hmm. and the museum says we really aren't sure. We want a disclaimer on this. And the museum is like, to, it's my understanding the museum to the auction house is like these are absolutely are not Colts. Like we believe they are not Colts. We're not selling them as Colts. And the auction house tries to talk them out of it. Okay, and then. It ends up they get sold to the auctioneer for way less than. I mean, they're right. still sold. It's still like two hundred thousand dollars. Now, the, now the, the auctioneer is not doing anything sketchy in this, by the way, because right. um, we've been just talking about people buying stuff left and right and how sketchy it is. But in right. this case, the auctioneer just says, "I know the museum says they're fraudulent, but I believe Wilson. I believe right. they are real. Right, and yeah, therefore, it... yeah." Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, no, no, no. But yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. The auctioneer is not doing anything sketchy there. That's a, rel that's a pretty common practice. You know, if the auctioneer wants something, they're you know, auctioneers can bid on things too. That's not unusual. Um, and so the guy, he buys it and he maintains the he believes they're you know these are cults and, you know, he's. It's not like he's a total novice on firearms. Like he knows guns too, so he can have an opinion on these, and that can be evaluated for what his opinion is worth. He's he is has enough knowledge to say to sort of evaluate the evidence. I should say. Right. So actually, I got it here. It's uh, Butterfield and Butterfield was the auction house. Oh, okay, yeah. And I then you're right, but that was it. Yeah, and then uh, let me see. The quote was okay. 
Um, they wanted a disclaimer that branded the guns as period counterfeits and patent infringements manufactured by an undetermined gun maker. And if that wasn't clear enough, they added, they are not considered products of Samuel Colt's patent firearms manufacturing company in Hartford, Connecticut. So that's what the disclaimer was. They insisted on it. The auction company fought them on it. They obviously did not bid up very high. I can't remember how low they went for, but it was very low. Yeah, it was like a third of their expected value or something. Right, and that's when the the actual um, gentleman from the auction house bought it because he was just like, no, I'm, I believe that they're worth more than this. And so he saw it as an opportunity, he bought them. So he's above board because he he's going off his own investments. Um, the The weird thing about all this is so it causes all this controversy now because it's this whole fight about whether or not they're real all over again. The museum's getting dragged through it again. And then it turns out they ended up raising the money just so if anybody's curious, they sold out of their coin collection. So they they went they went and sold coins in order to get the money for the statue. And that worked out fine. And they got enough money that they didn't need to sell that pair of revolvers at all. And they could have avoided the whole. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like it was this whole mess. And then they came up with a bunch of other money anyway. And that's, you know, we haven't talked about part of the reason like these people you know, that, that, that they have some credibility that the museum staff at least didn't they had to trust wilson because they didn't have the knowledge is that their small staff in the state library collected all of connecticut history items so there's coin collections there's furniture collections there's textile collections you know it, it's a really broad museum collection scope right and there's only a handful of staff so they had to rely on volunteer expertise sort of like wilson to understand what they had and the one other detail in the whole trade situation that i i forgot to mention is that and this is probably the last detail i think that's relevant to everything is that the serial number one patterson that came into the collection the investigators hit on then david white drove it up to an engraver recommended by wilson under the guise of reproducing a copy of it to then sell like reproducing like a couple hundred copies of this gun to then sell as copies to raise money for the museum the guy they take it to says he can't do it it's way too intricate i'm not going to do it but the gun is left with him for two weeks totally unsupervised so that's another issue and as i mentioned there's this whole question of like mid 20th century fakes and forgeries that still haunts us today of like, there were gunsmiths out there that could do the work on a level that we would be very hard pressed to tell the difference from original work. And he, and probably one of those guys had that gun for two weeks. Okay. So that was the number one Patterson. That's the number one Patterson. Now we haven't seen a second number one Patterson, so it could be the original. Yeah. So that one, that one could be just fine, but it's just, it's, there's nothing to say that that went wrong and that, and you know, that may have been the guy they really did intend to produce copies and the guy decided he couldn't do it. To me, the guy would have known what he was getting into for, with a Patterson. He would have at that level, he would have seen one, but he, you know, he knew of them. Like it's the question would be, I guess like, well, where is the actual, if that is a reproduction number one Patterson, where would the original one be? Or did, was there never actually a number one? Well, that's, yeah, so the gun goes back to the library, and as far as I know, it's still there. The question is, was, like, something, was anything untoward done during its time, those two weeks? Was a copy made and then sold overseas where it wouldn't come up again? Was something else done to, you know, it's it's one of those things where we have absolute, that's where there's, like, no evidentiary trail, except that it's really weird for a guy to have all these schemes moving or all these moving parts I, I shouldn't call them schemes if we're trying to be fair but have all these moving parts this one happen and nothing come of it like that's right odd. i guess my in my mind it's like so this is post trade yes i guess the one speculation i would have is that maybe it's not actually serial number one and they realized they messed something up and they had to go fix it real quick before anybody noticed i don't know that's like the one goofy thing i think of yeah. Or it's completely benign and it's just bizarre and Yeah. Or it's just another bizarre piece of this puzzle. The of course, all throughout this time, Wilson's writing books on Colts, he's 
doing more appraisals, he's brokering more deals. You know, an article does get published about everything in the 80s, and it creates, you know, this investigation goes public, and that creates a stir, but there's no trial, there's no conviction. Wilson maintains his innocence. A lot of people believe him. A few don't. He seems to lay low for most of the 90s, publishing, earning his rep, um, you know, or earning a positive reputation, I should say, writing books, doing appraisals, brokering deals. It's only towards the late 90s and early 2000s where things start to go south again. And Wilson seems to have trouble in that he's he's buying and selling guns for people and not always paying. And that's what ultimately sends him for a one year and one day prison sentence in the early 2000s. He gets charged with, um, I think wire fraud is the crime that he does time for. Now, technically in this case, it was a bit of a pyramid scheme, right? Right. And that's what the later investigators would call it. They would compare it to a Ponzi scheme where Wilson would use the money from one sale to pay back his previous sale and then sort of keep that going forward. And then this, this sale is the one that kind of caught up to him. And it, it's pretty bizarre because it supposedly involves like a member of a crime family and the gun of a, you know, a gun that belonged to a Royal family in Europe. Oh boy. Um, so that's really bizarre. And of course, by this point, a couple other people come forward and allege that Wilson stole their guns outright. Um, he's, he goes through a bankruptcy in the early 2000s. Um, there's one really, it's just, I can't see it in any other way but sad because, like, I don't want any of this to be true. I wish it was just like we had a great cult guy and some resentful people wanted to tear him down. Be- because this does so much damage to the collecting world and it calls so many things into question. And I just, I don't want to be, people are always awful about it, but there's this one quote from a guy that says Wilson owed him $400,000. And this was like, while the trial was going public and he still, Wilson's in jail, having just declared bankruptcy, all this info is public. And the guy still believes that Wilson's going to pay him back. And it's just like, what? like, I mean, I guess like good on you for having faith in him that to that extent, but it's, it's also like sort of heartbreaking that somebody would be out that much and sort of like grasping at straws. Wilson gets out of um, his prison sentence and immediately goes to another trial where he had been, um, he was on trial for defrauding or conspiring to defraud Owsley Frazier, who founded the Frazier Museum in Kentucky. And I, full disclaimer, I worked there for, that was where I got my start in the museum world. Oh, so you have touched on this twice over now. Yes, I have. Um, so Wilson is part of that trial and Wilson and another dealer are on trial. I think the dealer's wife are all named as defendants. I believe Wilson and the wife of the dealer are acquitted. The dealer is sentenced to, I think two years in prison for what the court holds was a scheme to defraud Mr. Make Mr. Frazier overpay for firearms. So one example is given that some of the guns were presented as original and they had been refinished. And it's this, this stuff that comes out in some of these trials where the courts are like the prosecutors are arguing guns are presented as original, even though they've been refinished, then sort of harkens back to the days of the dragoons. Like, you know, before then, it was just a solitary example. But then here's a, a repeat example and a clearer how this worked situation. So, yeah, walk walk this back for a second, because it must be kind of difficult to prove, because he ends up doing jail time on the second one, right? So Wilson's acquitted on the second one. The other, the dealer does jail time. But he's, then, so he's tangential to the dealer. He was the appraiser for those deals. So the okay, so dealer the, the, was hired directly by Frazier to buy the guns for Frazier's collection. So in the Frazier case, they they didn't even complete the sale necessarily, right? Because it was it was conspiracy to defraud or I think it was conspiracy to defraud and something else. 
they the the dealer ends up going to jail for tax evasion is i think the actual final charge is i oh, okay only thing to do. but um, the idea is that there's there's these faked colts in the deal is that what's going on not well yeah i mean some of these guns i mean he's buying all sorts of it's winchesters and there's okay. holland, holland and there's colts and some of the allegations is that some of these guns are presented as original and they've been embellished and so that's part of it the other half of it is that wilson the dealer will buy a gun you know for one of the guns is given as six hundred thousand right. dollars he then sells it to mr frazier for nine hundred thousand dollars and then Wilson appraises it once it's in Mr. Frazier's hands for th- like $3 million. And that happened, that sort of chain happens a couple of times. So de- dealer buys gun for X, sells it to Frazier for an increase, a substantial increase. Wilson then a- convinces appraises Frazier it for him. he's getting a deal because here's what the appraisal is the dealer always maintains that he was making, you know, he had been authorized by Frazier to make a commission. You know, he's like, I, you know, I'm a dealer. I can't do this for free. Like I'm spending a lot of time and effort on this. I deserve to make a profit. The allegation but of course is but that he's setting he's charging his, like way more than. Profit. Right. So he, he's setting his own margin versus right. an actual commission number that Frazier knows right. about. Right, okay. and it seems like Frazier sort of sets him up for sets himself up for failure here because he never has a set commission rate. He there seems to be an agreement that there was a commission he could charge a commission rate. Frazier never, it never comes out that he's at least I'm aware of that he set the actual rate. So there was nothing like, all right, go buy guns, charge me fifteen percent, and we'll all be happy. Right. And to be course, fair, that's a terrible way of doing a commission argument, too, though. Right. And, uh, of course, then that pretends that there's no allegations of sort of refinished guns. Right. So Wilson's defenders will still use this acquittal here as evidence that Wilson, you know, oh, he was acquitted. Like, see, it was all just, it was drummed up. They typically ignore the Connecticut case. I think it's also kind of out of common memory now. Right. And nobody really talks about the embellished stuff because, and here's where I start to get into like, this is, if anything will get me in trouble about this, it'll probably be what I'm about to say next is because. Okay. Yeah, everybody get ready. We're going to, we're going to repeat this everywhere on the internet for Danny. I feel as a curator having to evaluate old cults that I cannot use R.L. Wilson books because like if you Google him and like go to the gun forums, people will be like, "Well, yeah, he he got seduced by the dark side in his career, or he made money, or did this or that." But his books are really great. He was a great guy to interact with. You know, maybe things went a little wrong, or you know, maybe to some of them things didn't go wrong at all. I've also seen the argument that, and this is I shouldn't put stock on what people write on the internet that much, but you know, it's some people say, "Well, he only was really taking advantage of." fat cats like Frazier. So, you know, what do I give about that? And, you know, that kind of goes back to my point about the, the original Sully deal is like, these guys were definitely taking advantage of each other, but in the end, they all walked away with it kind of knowing the game. Right. And so I guess, I guess I see that I don't really buy it, but it, for me, all the, all the books he wrote, are also in question because the guns, some of the guns in those books are in question because the engraving issues and the embellishment issues. And when, if you take a serious academic look at the works Wilson has published, they're really tough to use. Right. His source, his material is not endnoted or footnoted, generally speaking. Right. He often has a bibliography. The bibliography usually pretty heavily relies on his other published works. Correct. Some of the guns in those books have been called into question and it comes up to the point where it's like, okay, these are really beautiful photographs and there's lots of flowery language here. I need to be able to substantiate this and I can't. And to me, it it just leaves this really dark cloud over cult collecting and collecting in general because yeah, it's really tough to do. And 
I've I've had people approach me. I have this gun. It's a really famous R.O. Wilson thing. It's been appraised by him. I've had at least one of these where it was a single gun that had a book published about it that they wanted to give to us at the museum. Right. And I turned it down because I found that gun at auction, like publicly listed at auction as a regular playing Colt. And then a few years later, it shows up as a super embellished, amazing gun. And I read the book and the book is just a lot of prose and not a lot of substance about why this gun should be, you know, to be, if I'm trying to be really generous to the gun, it's because the engraver who did it did this really amazing work and he's a highly sought after engraver. But the price that people wanted for the museum, I mean, one, it's, it's an issue of price. Like people think the museums have a lot of money to be buying stuff. Yeah, I don't, where do museums get money from? I I, I don't know. You know, when we're, (laughs) to be a little bit mean about all this, when, you know, there's so many people knocking at the doors trying to take advantage, like (laughs) the money goes fast. Yeah. Um, And that's where I also don't buy the Frazier argument. I'll go back to that in a second. But for this gun, it's like, there's a ton of stuff suspect about this. This book is just the most, it's mostly prose and not a real argument is why. And then when I apply that lens to other Wilson books, I start to find they're not usable as academic sources on the history of Colt or the history of even the guns of Bertrand. And because of Wilson's history, I have to, I have to call everything into double question. Like I have to be really, really thorough about any of those guns because even if I think they're honest guns, there's always going to be a, a cloud over it. Right. I don't, you know, I was having trouble reading the Wilson books because they're, they're written. You're not wrong. Like the way they're set up in prose. The problem is the substance is all over the place. Mm-hmm. And I, I just couldn't find anything verifiable. Like I kept, I was reading them going, these read like brochures. They read like catalogs and right. their, their sales, their sales material is what it really is. And so when I went to try to back up what he had and I was checking the bibliographies, I went, what the heck's going on? So I was talking to you about um, more reliable sources because, you know, it's him and some other authors that I was trying to read. So uh, what ended up being one of my preferred books, I believe, was from like 1948 or something. And the problem with 40s era books, especially, is that they try to it's the peak of what I would call modernism. Like we have to deal with postmodernism now and some of the weird stuff that happens there. But at the peak of modernist writing, you would have these like grand like statements, like nothing could be said that wasn't uh, positive or negative. It had to be hardcore yes or no. And so when you read those forties books, they'll just say, well, we see this. And actually I shouldn't even say that because they won't say, because I saw these six examples, obviously yellow is yellow you know they just say yellow is yellow and then they don't tell you why they came to that conclusion they don't tell you what the evidence is based off of and so to give a really strong example of that the they had a recreation of the sales slip for the texas revolvers and it drives me nuts to this very moment and i cannot find anything about it my entire episodes i might have to turn inside out at some point because when you look at the sales receipt for the um the initial order of Texas Patterson's, it says belt model, not holster model. It says belt. It doesn't say the caliber either. So everybody says it's the number five, but the number five wasn't the belt. And yet then they go on to say that further contracts and number fives, and they had this barrel length and all this other stuff. And I have to go, I guess there's another sheet of paper that clarifies this somewhere, but it, there's no mention of it. And it drives me insane because I'm sitting there going, I'm looking at a document that says belt model. You're telling me it's the holster model. And then nowhere do you clarify in any of the verbiage around it. Do you say, by the way, I know it says belt model, but it's actually the holster model. Here's how I know that. Mm -hmm. Because they just never explain that stuff in the 40s. They just go right over it. There's probably a reason they've made that call. They will never explain it in their writing. They just announce things and move on. And so Wilson was supposed to be that 70s, 80s era where things get clarified in most of the gun writing. And instead, it's just this sales slip. And it, it's not, there's no analysis. They, usually you see books in the 70s and 80s, they refer back to the 40s and they go, 
yeah, they said this, that's because of this. Here's where a memo from here. Wilson has none of that stuff. Instead, he just announces things like it's the 40s all over again, but much more colorfully. And so I, I have a hard time trusting the material. And But I see that argument about his stuff all the time. Maybe there's something wrong here, but he did great books. And from like a visual point of view, they are like, they're beautiful. Like the photography's great. They're showing really awesome examples of cults if you take them at face value. But from like a historian trying to do research, there, there's not what you need to be there. And, you know, I say this is the thing that's going to, that could get me in the most trouble. Like, this is a hugely divisive issue in part of the gun collecting community. Wilson passed in 2016. He was active in the community until he, until he died. People, you know, I, I know collectors, I know board members, I know other, you know, people in the museum world still have respect to him. People that I respect and look up to say that he was wronged. People that I respect say that he was a crook. Donors, like I said, at every level, if you're into old guns, like there are people out there with opinions on them. And, you know, I might say something here that somebody that gave stuff to the museum is really unhappy about. But as I look at the situation, you know, it, this is how it is. You know, this is what I see. So it's a really tough one because like I said, there's, there's some serious division here and I have people that feel really strongly about this whole issue that I look up to that take both sides of this issue. And I, you know, I think your listeners and will gather that I tend to be towards the, he defrauded some people side, but yeah, it's, it's divisive. To be fair. Okay. If, if we took his, if we had uh, any sort of transparency on his information, we could separate out what was the pandering or inflating of prices or whatever the, the thing we're worried he may have done. Even if it, let's say you think that he did no wrong. That's mm -hmm. fine. It, let's say that you think he's a scoundrel. Also fine, because neither one of those affect whether or not any given statement he made was true. Mm -hmm. Like the individual statements could be true or false. Correct. The problem I have with that is since he doesn't cite, source, or explain anything, at least not as far as I've read, I don't know. He just makes assertions, and then I don't know how to prove them out, you know? Yeah, and, it, and yeah, that's that's a great point. Like, there's no, there's no way for either side to sort of track down what actually happened or what is actually right about this stuff because, you know, to give an example, Herb House, he's passed as well. He was our curator at uh, CFM for a while, and he was our curator emeritus for a long time. And he's the first one that sort of let me in on the story. And, of course, I referenced him in his trade with the State Library. He, he claimed at one point that there was a particular, I believe it was at 1866 Winchester, that Wilson brokered the deal on publicly. And according to Herb, Herb had photos of the same gun as Herb put it, much worse for the wear from the 50s. So, but it's just little bits and pieces on both sides of the coin that get at, was he scoundrel, was he fine? And it's never, there's no way to corroborate any right. of it at this point. Well, for my, unfortunately, if you're one of the people holding one of those guns, you need to maybe know that answer or try to find that answer. For me personally, it's not that big of a deal, except for the part where I have to be able to somewhat or not at all trust an author. Right. And so I guess if anybody's going to start doing their own research, I think the, the, the message here is always keep your notes. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it, to be fair, I've seen myself. So this is the thing that drives me crazy. I'll see myself as a citation on, say, like Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And it kind of drives me crazy because all I'm doing is echoing some other author. So that means you have to come to my video and then check the read links in my video. And then the way YouTube's set up, I can't really footnote individual claims. So you're going to have to read every book that I list and figure out where I got it from. So I'm not what you would consider an academic resource. People treat me like one, mm -hmm. and I feel bad about it, to be honest, because I shouldn't be. Um, I'm really just a consolidator of what is contemporary understanding. And then from there, if you want to assert that or argue that or whatever the case may be, you're going to have to go to my sources. Um, there's been... 
all very few things that have been uh, released by me as means of primary research. Um, and really, it's it's the, the handful of things that I've done primary primary research on that have turned up are me specifically finding uh original documents with dates on it that sort of narrow some things down there's been a couple of mechanical observations where i've been able to get a hold of a gun that's uncommon and i got lucky and there was a mark or something that got folded over so i could say oh this wasn't a new made bolt head this was a remanufactured bolt head there's been a few little things like that that i can provably say um but realistically those are my tiny little contributions everything else about me is just repackaging and so if you think of like Wilson's books, they sort of resemble the same thing. So I don't want to tear them down. They look like a repackaging of information that he was able to find out there. That's at least how they read to me. The problem yeah. is I can't seem to figure out where he repackaged it from or where it was discovered from. You know, I, there's no inventory list that I can go back to to figure out where the, the assertions were made. So that's my concern. Yeah. And, and there's all sorts, you know, sort of, you know, Herb would tell me things in like conversation that he believed had happened and he would reference, you know, these famous collections of the fifties, but, you know, with Wilson and Herb and others, like when, as they pass, like we lose the connection to those. And then it's really, really tough to find like, okay, this collection was really famous to you guys. I have no idea how to find any information, you know, like, it's not like, like even the Soli stuff, I don't even know where to start looking for an inventory of Soli stuff or the Sutherland stuff before it, it you know, it, it's, but those guys knew that stuff, um, and it's it's just really hard to check. And you know, I say this too: a lot of people treat the Wilson stuff as if it was a recent sort of wayward debate. Did he did he turn to the dark side or not? Sort of towards the end of his career. My opinion, sort of after reading all this investigative stuff, is that this at least suspect behavior started, you know, all the way back in the mid '70s, and then you know, and then of course that calls into question you know all that stuff where he was making a trade that was supposed to go he talked to the state library into guns going to another museum and then he immediately sold them like that's pretty right that's not great and that's a long time before any of the current debates around around this and then to me that calls into question a lot of later stuff so that's that's where i have an issue with it and not to like keep beating on this issue but it's just it's it's really tough you know, it's it's really tough to sort it all out, but I think it's an important story to the history of collect because there are people that say Wilson nearly single handedly elevated gun collecting to the mainstream. Right. You know, like before this was a real hobbyist thing. It didn't have any respect among the auction houses. It didn't have any respect, you know, among other collectors. Wilson made it mainstream. He made it some so that an art collector could get interested in firearms and that raises the profile for everybody and makes the guns more historic. It makes them more or not historic. It makes them more valuable monetarily speaking. It makes them more interesting to a broader audience. So, so everyone, that. everyone that's upset about how expensive all these uh, old firearms now is you can blame RL Wilson. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I mean, that's the flip <laughs> side of it. Cause that's the other thing I wanted to touch on. And like, this is a soapbox for me. So, whether or not Wilson is guilty of this, that's up for the listeners to go out and determine. What is clear to me in all of this is when you and I say a gun is worth what someone will pay for it as like a statement, as sort of a piece of advice, we are sort of talking about, all right, this gun goes up on gun broker. I'm kind of interested. Maybe somebody else's. I set my budget. They set theirs. And they set theirs higher than mine. And they were willing to pay more for that gun in that instance what these guys were willing to believe about, because these guys use that phrase in their investi in their reports to the state police. I think they have an entirely different mentality about it where the gun is worth whatever someone will pay to it. To them means the gun is whatever we can convince someone to pay for it. So, right. And it's, you're going to be like, well, that's, what is that? That's the same thing. But it, there's a nuance there that I think is these guys recognize if they could keep the gun, the Sully collection from going to public auction, if they could be the buyers and the sellers and the brokers, they could control the prices in a way that no one else could. And if they were setting the prices, then they could talk people into paying those prices because they were also the experts 
Right. And that's what they understood the phrase to mean. It's like a little tiny diamond trade. Yeah, it, it really is. So that's that's sort of the dark side. But the positive side is that supposedly he raised gun collecting to a new height to make it sort of respectable, to get people involved and interested. And now the hobby is shared by a much wider audience. Yeah. Some of it also can be the name premium. Like, I want to be fair to this because there's still today, there's sellers that, and I don't want to name names, but there's a number of companies that there's a gun that you could buy on GunBroker all day, uh, some Swiss rifle, let's say, for $400 all day on GunBroker. Yeah. And they'll list one on their website for six and it'll be sold out. And it's yeah. just, it, it's something about the name, the destination, the name recognition, whatever the case may be. There's, there's, there's a number of people that start orbiting and they start getting a, a, a feeling of confidence buying from someone and they'll pay over price all the time because they want to buy from that person just because they don't even want to look at the other alternatives or think about making the buy somewhere else. And you guys probably know one or two sites like that. And that's just how it is. They end up making good money just on the fact that they've made good money before. Yeah. And you know, I think there's something to be said that that's a fair way to approach it. You know, and I think probably some of Wilson's report or supporters, excuse me, would say, well, that's what's happening. You know, he was he was a trusted guy and he wrote all the books on Colt. So I'll go to him and I'm willing to pay a premium to get the best stuff and to get it reliably. Yeah, I think the big fear is if if he actually was involved with any actual fakery. Right. That's that's the big fear. And of course, I think in the museum deal. I can't come down on it any other way. The guns he traded out just weren't duplicates. Like he said they were, he was trading one of a kind stuff and he knew it and he was taking advantage of his trusted status. Right. And so I've, I've tried to tell the story as like, as factually as I could, but I feel really strongly that that was, that was a really raw deal for the museum. And some of those guns, some of those guns have resurfaced. At least one of them has resurfaced in another museum some of those guns, you know, because the debate about, well, museums just stick stuff in back drawers and they don't see, you know, public display. So what's the difference between them going to a private collector who might show them to you or to Ian or somebody? And I get that to an extent, but definitely some of these guns that went to private collections have not seen the light of day since this trade happened. Or they've been damaged. Or the, the other problem, it yeah. goes back and forth too. It depends on the museum. It depends on their culture. It depends on who's in control because I um, there's an argument between you know museums versus private owners and just as someone who does my show obviously i have a way easier time working with private ownership because anything goes as long as the owner says so um and there's no boards there's no reviews there's no what because honest to god and i don't want to out any one particular person because to be frank it's happened in a lot of places but when i try to deal with museums it's it's a remarkable at how little can happen without involving a bunch of people who have personality conflicts and will just burn it down just to burn it down. And so sometimes it can be very tricky to work out of a public collection or a institutional collection. And yet it can be very easy to work out of just one individual because all you have to do is impress upon that one individual. So there's something said for them to be in these hands versus those hands and what it means to the community, depending on how you interpret that. But if it's a, if it, if it is a reliable museum, then there's a lot that can be done to preserve these artifacts in ways that people don't even understand. So, uh, like you guys had that recent remodel, and one of the big things that you've like your number one complaint, I think it is, is how dark it is in the museum. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that. Well, yeah, it has to be dark because light ultimate, even light ultimately erodes on these pieces over time. Yeah, and you know our mindset in the museum world is you're caring for these things for generations. So ultimately, if a researcher like yourself is somewhat frustrated, there's some people that, you know, I view that as a defeat. Like, you know, there were, there's been times where I, I said I would help you and then something came up and I couldn't hold up my end of the bargain. And to me, that's a defeat. That's a, that's a poor outcome. But there's some people that says, well, and this is in the museum world, the research might not have got what they wanted and maybe we didn't get the exposure, but ultimately the gun's still safe. So who cares? Right. You know, like, Cause it's on lockdown. It's and, on and, lockdown. But, and... but that's a, that's, that's a real trade-off handling. So 
and th- now we're way off R.L. Wilson, but just something that's interesting for people to understand. Um, I don't know if it was in your books or not, but when you and I went through a walk through Cody, um, we were just going through racks of stuff. It was you, me, and Ian hanging out. And one of the things that was very fascinating to me is that as we're going through, I looked over and I went, oh, there's a prototype for the Winchester Model 11. And when we went to reach for it, it was just an Auto 5 with the like a very early Auto 5 with the um, grip welded onto it. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh my God, it's a prototype of the Winchester Model 11 that's so early that it's just an Auto 5 because that's what they were doing. They were just trying to figure out how the hell to open that gun up without using the lever. And they grabbed yeah. one that was probably bought for reference and they just were like, well, we're done referencing it. Let's just like so the as far as i mean there's no paper trail but it looks like just off that one observation sitting in the back room where thankfully it's been preserved because somebody might not have known the story um you know it's weird but it's, yeah has it been sitting gathering quote unquote dust not that it was dusty but yeah it's been sitting there but the right person comes along later on and you go oh boy there's the whole story right there and it's yeah. just been sitting there waiting to be discovered so I don't think it's wrong to have this stuff cataloged away, especially if it's part of a collection, because then it can lead you to see what's really happening. But that's why I worry. Like when you say they broke up the 290 pieces that were in Colt's collection, to me, that's 290 points of reference that may intersect in ways that we did not understand. Yeah. You lose what we would call in the museum world, what we would probably call like a original order for lack of a better term. You know, there's right. there's something in how these guns were put together by these companies that speaks to their nature. And it might take us a while to figure that out and it might not it might be somebody down the road, but there are reasons they stayed together. And when you break them up, you lose something that you cannot get back. Right. It's also even the stuff that you don't think of. The fact that two guns are together at all. So if you get a Winchester collection and in the middle of that you have Stevens or um, other manufacturing firearms that are in that collection, well, that tells you what Winchester was aware of and when they were aware of it. Because if they're buying early Stevens whatever, that means that they're they're analyzing that market, and especially if they're playing with them, like what happened with the Auto 5. It yeah, tells you-, you It tells you a lot about their perspective on the market when they made certain changes. And, it, you know, it says, you know, to use Auto 5 as an example, it's like, it would be really easy, you know, as, you, if this trade was happening at Cody, like somebody, I didn't know a lot about guns, and somebody trusted came in and said, hey, this is just an Auto 5, like, you guys are a Winchester collection, not a Remington collection, let's get rid of this thing. I'd be like, okay, like, that seems reasonable. And then, like... All of a sudden, this Auto 5 is gone that tells a really important story. Winchester got that because they were figuring out how to make a semi-auto shotgun. And they started with the 5. Right. And it tells a whole story there. And I, I think that's kind of what happened here with the State Library trade is there was a whole story. And it was just, for whatever reason, Winchester has this Auto 5. And now we know why. For whatever reason, Colt had these guns together. And they, they did not want the guns to be sold. Like that was a key thing. They didn't want them leaving and they were, you know, they centered on that exact duplicate language. So, and now we're, we could never know why these were together. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the interrelation of the pieces is really critical. Like if they came in onesie twosie, um, then when they go out onesie twosie, maybe not a big deal, but when they come in as a block, the block relationship can be critical. Absolutely. Yeah. So, that is the R.L. Wilson story <laughs> as best I know it. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's uh, you unpacked it far further than I thought. I so there's a comparable thing that I recommend to anybody I talk about like this. It's a documentary called Sour Grapes, and it's about fraud in the wine collecting world. Okay. The interest. The reason I bring it up here is because at least one of the victims interviewed in that has an almost mythical cult and is a very high profile person and that deal was also brokered that the deal for that cult was brokered by wilson Ooh, so okay there's a connection there and i know of that story because herb was hired to do an appraisal of this person's collection and this is very tangential at this point 
Herb went there, did the appraisal of all the guns they showed him, and then Herb asked their business manager, where is the Colt? And the business manager tried to deny knowledge. And Herb's like, I know about this. Here's what it is. Do you have it? Can I put it on the appraisal? And eventually, apparently, Herb was able to talk him into seeing it and putting it on the appraisal because this person didn't get rid of it. They kept it right. as sort of, for whatever reason, I'm not really sure. But that was a story that Herb related to me. And Herb had his own way of storytelling that I'm not, I could believe was sometimes embellished or exaggerated. Right. So you're trying to filter. But, like, it's an interesting crossover to me for whatever. <laughs> Yeah, it's really weird how much these things intersect. I will say, I'm very glad that I'm poor um, because it's not that no one can take advantage of me. It's just that they can only take advantage of me for a few bucks. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I cannot collect at the level where it becomes... Right. I can't get ripped off for $2.5 million because I, if you sold everything I own, you wouldn't get within, like, $2.5 million of it. <laughs> no, it's like, oh, this Spanish Mauser, the seller didn't tell me there was rust on the underside of the barrel like yeah i'm out like 100 bucks yeah you know it's, it's that level not this is a highly engraved cult that was supposed to be a nimshki and it's not and i'm really screwed yeah like the uh the othias collection uh, valued at over 2500 dollars <laughs> uh, but i mean it's just interesting to hear and of course this sort of stuff is going to attract all sorts of problems though you know what i mean because who who has the cojones to wander into that market anyway like you're not going to want people looking over like hey danny uh, i'm about to make a 2.5 million dollar deal do you feel comfortable being the only person to sign off on this i'm just gonna put your name here yeah, you know yeah. like yeah you're gonna be like uh can we get somebody else in here just so i don't end up in court later like but oh well and it, you know it, it pops up i've seen this because i've been in other museums like i've experienced it with other collecting worlds i always told people you know people talk about oh i didn't know such something would be valuable and it's like if it is halfway interesting field it is collectible to someone and there's oh yeah like almost everything's collectible to a degree well and i uh... it seems even small stuff there's like weird frauds that happen in small stuff and yeah it's yeah. not just a gun thing. It's not a wine thing. It's not an art thing. It's like anything collectible is. On uh, on that front, I can tell a story that some of the listeners will appreciate. Are my co-star Kevin from the Hand Trap series? He um, he had a visitor uh, because Matthew Larus here, the uh, guy who's doing Fud Busters, he's uh, working over for um, Farms Policy Coalition and stuff like that. Uh, they got together over last weekend. And uh, I got sent, I was texted a photo of Matt digging through Kevin's garbage can. And I was like, okay. And so apparently what had happened was Kevin had said, uh, Matt had commented on a Sega CD game that Kevin had out. And Kevin's like, oh, you can have that. And he's just like, are you sure? Do you know how much this is worth? Because apparently Matt pays attention to Sega CD game prices. And he shows them on eBay. That's like, I think that game was like 150 bucks, 200 bucks or something like that. And Kevin goes, I threw away like a whole box of this stuff. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and Matt's like, why would you do that? And Kevin's like, I don't know. I know better than that. I should know better than that. I work at a pawn shop. I should, why am I, why did I do that? And so both like, so <laughs> Matt, Kevin's like, I think they might be still in the garbage can. So then they're both digging through the garbage can. So, you know, know what you got before you sell it or throw it away. <laughs> yeah. The the flip side of this is I was at a gun show uh, last weekend and there was a guy with like a bunch of rotted fire. I mean, they had been in the shed and he wants like, you know, $800 for every right. single shot, whatever. And you're just like, okay, maybe you should also know what you have. Yeah. And it's this question of like people's ability to perceive originality and stuff like that. I always think of the story of like, there's a collector and this, I feel like I'm just trying to one up you now and that was not my intention, but uh, go for it. I talked to a collector one time and he's like, I have this mint original. I think it was a Marlin rifle. He's like right. untouched, beautifully original. This gun's awesome. You guys should take it for the museum. I was like, that sounds really cool. Like super interesting. You know, we collect old Marlins, you know, to a degree. And I was like, can you send me some photos and information? And he, like there's this back and forth, a couple emails, a couple phone calls, and he finally admits that he changed out all the wood on it. 
but he insisted it was still 100 percent original and i was like that's it's not it's, how original it's not works how it works. <laughs> yeah i also have a working theory that there's no 100 percent guns left but that's a different topic the, oh really uh, in the market you mean just maybe anywhere uh i don't know dealing with my i'm so i'm such budget conscious that i don't think i have a single all matching anything so i just i don't pay for pristine i just shoot or grade yeah me personally i don't i don't collect pristine or pay for uh, you know i i go out and buy the gun that i find interesting that day you know when i am i'm not really buying a lot of guns um but i don't know i look at like guns in a museum and guns that were like kept at a factory collection their whole lives and it's like it's a really tough sell to me when somebody's like this is a hundred percent yeah i agree i wouldn't know how to assess it like i i can't i can't make those calls as much as i would want to say i could it's i've seen it so infrequently that you could even claim it that i don't i'm like you i doubt it exists in a way i mean i i guess people taking the negative could be like well you're just a pretentious snotty curator so no but i mean even just in terms of like the research i we did photos talking about the prototype 1911s you know what i mean just the nature of those guns they sort of consume themselves so even the prototypes you have have wear on the barrel and stuff because of the way they function so they were test fired at the factory and therefore have you know x number of issues i don't know and i see and this is we're way past wilson now but i mean i guess it gets into the issue of like when a gun is engraved and at what skill level does it take to fool somebody? Because I see letters like our, we have records for the Skyly Hartley and Graham company and they imported anything they could get their hands on, you know, in the heydays of surplus firearms. Oh yeah. And we have letters from them of like, these guns are 10 years old and they're refinishing them and then reselling them. And so could I tell the difference between the specific letter I'm thinking of is Spanish, a batch of Spanish Mausers. Right. The guns would have been made in the 1890s. They were imported by 1910, and then Hartley and Graham refinished them and resold them. Is there any way that I would have to tell a refinished job from 1910 and the subsequent wear from the original finish of 1890? And there might be, and some like person that collects those will be like, yep, it's right, here's the telltale sign. Yada, yada. Right, right. But to me, a well-done job just within 15 years of when the gun was originally made that's, you know, and, you know, we're still talking a century either way. It's, we're oh, talking yeah. just a small fractional difference in time period. And the subsequent wear to the, both of the finishes, like, I don't think I could tell that apart. Right. No, I was reading, um, just recently, I was reading about, like, the old Saxon uh, Smith & Wesson clone revolvers. And apparently when they were sold in the commercial market, they were all refinished and checkered and everything. And so it's almost impossible to find them with smooth grips now. Because just the the one guy that got a hold of them had them all refinished. So what are you going to do? Um, there's actually a lot of that sort of choke point where everything goes through one particular importer or one particular reseller, and they mess with everything. And then or one broker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we're getting way down the rabbit hole, and we've been at it for oh my god, we're closing in on two hours, Danny. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I uh, I went I went in deep. The, the, that's okay. They'll, uh, I guarantee you with this group, they'll be so happy. Like this, that We're going to get a lot of positive comments. So um, well, I really enjoyed talking about it. I hope I, you know, don't make, I hope people understand if they hear about this later that I'm trying to be as fair as I can, but I have to like do my due diligence as a historian in this. So two, two things. How do people reach you personally so they can yell at you? <laughs> I mean, they can always email me at the museum. Okay. So do you want my email address you gotta tell them so that they oh, know it's danny m at center of the west.org okay danny m at center of the west he tried to say it fast but you can yeah, try really get the hate mail going actually it, the best way is to just add us on twitter with your most hottest takes uh, that's a good point um that's what i was going to say next though is what do we do for cody firearms museum like how do people interact with that support it like what's the best path to the cody firearms museum online so our website is centerofthewest.org. That's the center-wide website, not just us, but you can find us on there. There's also, and good news is our digital collection is back up and running, so people should be able to go search through all of our guns and tell I us love what's wrong that. with them. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Cody Firearms Museum, on Twitter at just Cody Firearms. Um, 
We also have our own podcast, History Unloaded. It's mostly myself and our former curator, Ashley, BSing um, very non academically. So we're, I've been told we're a very specific taste. So if not, everybody's. <laughs> So it's history unloaded, and if I search that on, like, I yeah, that's pretty much on all the major podcast platforms. So. History unloaded, and then um, I guess Facebook right now. I don't know about you, but you and I, I think we're talking about Instagram being real hard to gain a following on anymore. Yeah, Facebook's been better for us lately. So if you want to go over there, I pay attention to all of them. I try and keep tabs on all of them. It's a little bit better if you hit us on Facebook. You can also try us on our Reddit account for Cody Firearms Museum. Okay. And then Danny will interact with you himself, by the way. He does a lot of video posting and showing off of weird firearm designs that they have there. And he answers a lot of questions. And I've been worse at it lately, so it. I will try are to you, get through that. Are you, are you just the only guy there that still knows what a gun is? or? Uh, no. So I have we have a curatorial assistant also named Dan. So for all the Bob Newhart fans, it's a very much a, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. Oh, Daryl. Um, but there's Dan and Dan, and then there's our records office staff that dig up info on old, uh, production records. And we just got more. So we used to be Winchester Marlin and LC Smith, and now we've added Ithaca and Savage. So if you have one of those and you want to look them up in the original production records, you can always give our records office a call as well. And then if it's. The head of your records office is famous at this point in yes. terms of like gun collectors. They love her. So Jesse much. is way cooler in the collecting community than I am. Yeah. Her. It's it's weird how certain people recognize her like right off the bat. Oh, yeah. Like I could walk through a show and nobody will talk to me. I mean, it's gotten less so this way or more recently. But I can still go through a show and not get a lot of people stop me, especially if it's not a Winchester related show. Jesse goes through a show and like she will not make it down an aisle without somebody being like, hey, I have this old gun. I need to know your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I love her to death, too. OK, well, I think that's it, right? Um, we're going to wrap so. this one out, guys. So by all means, check out Cody Firearms Museum. Send some love to Danny for now dedicating an hour. Seriously, he put in a lot of work to tell you this story. Go go visit Danny for five minutes, all right? Send him a hug. But um, otherwise, uh, I'm not sure when this is getting released, but it's right. It's near Christmas one way or another. So Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Um, hope everybody's warm and safe and I hope you still are enjoying all the, uh, the gun content. The next, there's going to be a second Patterson episode and then we're back to regular center fire stuff. Um, so hold on to your, hold on to your seats. All right. Bye guys.